Okay, classic character profile time. It's a big one this week, um, and it's all been inspired by the sad, sad news that the Lassagaru pub up in Manchester, where we went to for last year's coronation, uh, the Corrie Fest, has been closed, which um, I was kind of gutted to hear that news, even though we only went there once. It was a really nice little pub, um, and it's been closed down because, well, the taking, takings have been down. The council are just like, well... Off you go, then. The council? Yeah, the brewery, wasn't it? No, no, it was the council, I think. Even though um, the pub had been well, won all these awards, like um, it was the vote of the best pub in Britain only two years ago, I think, because it, it, there was a load of entertainment there, we, not just the Corrie Fest, it was it hosted loads of things. And, um, but unfortunately, in the local area, they, they used to have the BBC um, buildings there and then they moved away and, I guess, custom dwindled, but... Real, real shame to hear that. Um, so, anyway, it all brings us to who we're going to do this week. It's uh, Ina Sharples, which is kind of the, the poster girl for the Lassa Gallery pub. Um, now, Ina is a character that Gemma and I don't didn't particularly know very much about because, obviously, she was well before our time. And I think even the classic Coronation Street episodes I used to watch on Granada Plus were after Ina's time. But um, she's certainly, certainly a big character and one of the kind of curry icons from the from the old guard so um Gemma tell us her vital statistics she was born on the 24th of November 1899 19th century wow just wow. she died before 1984 at some point her parents were Thomas and Mary Schofield and she had um a sister Alice Reynolds and a brother Tom Schofield she was married to Alfred Sharples in 1920 and she had three children Vera Lomax in 1921 Mad Sharples in 1924 and then Ian Sharples who was presumably grown I, from a leg because he doesn't have a birth date no I think it's I think he was like this is a baby that died after like a couple of years or something so I don't know don't count then. It's very rude. First appeared on the 9th of December 1960. First episode of Coronation Street. She was in the first scene in the shop. And she last appeared on the 2nd of April in 1980, which, as we all know, was the last episode of Coronation Street. No, it wasn't. The number of appearances, she was in 1150 episodes. Yeah, and that's put her at the 44th most featured character on Coronation Street, although it's very, very soon to be taken over by Sean. I think, um, in, in fact, by even today's episode, Sean may like be equaling Ina's episode count or overtaking. Incredible. I know. So um, I don't think it means that Sean's going to be quite so iconic as Ina in the future. Knows? I think it's quite measured by that. Anyway, played by Violet Carson. Um, so Ina was a renowned gossip and curtain twitcher. She was like the the character that was almost uh, the viewer that kind of always wanted to know what was going on. And she she had a finger in many pies. She 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 kind of prided herself in knowing more about the residents of Coronation Street than than they thought that she knew because uh, she liked to have lots of ammunition for her explosive arguments that she'd often have against them. Especially Elsie Tanner was one of um, her frequent sparring partners she just like she liked him she had made it her business to know everyone else's business basically and um interesting facts that i learned from the uh coronation street book that i read over christmas that she was based on tony warren's grandmother did he like his grandmother yeah i think so <laughs> i think he if he would have got a slap for that wouldn't he <laughs> she was a last minute hiring violet carson was mm-hmm. yes the, yeah, because there were dry runs before the episodes were filmed in 1960, or the first episode was filmed. And it, um, Ina had originally been played by Nita Valerie and Nan Marriott Watson, what whoever they are. What names they had back in the 60s. Nan is the name of the girl from um, American Horror Story 3, isn't it? Oh, yeah. She's called Nan. I like that name. As like a sort of wholesome kind of Nan. girl <laughs> name. <laughs> Maybe. I, I don't think we would call our child that. No, <laughs> my child's not going to be a wholesome girl. Well, the, these people, these two actresses were only kind of there for the run-throughs, and they couldn't find anybody permanent. So um, Granada told um, Tony Warren that he had to delete the character of Ina because they, they just couldn't find anyone that matched the, the idea that he had of her in her head. And that's when he took a chance on Violet Carson, who he'd known from when he'd played alongside her in um, an old BBC show called Chin- Children's Hour. And it was quite a big risk because... I suppose with like any older actress, it's it's going to be difficult to convince them to take on this regular job, this big role. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, she was she was up for it, and thank goodness she, she was. 
Now, a lot of Ina's backstory was created for her in um, some of the books that were published in the 1970s, 1980s, I think. Like there was uh, Keeping the Home Fires Burning and Coronation Street, The War Years and Around the Houses, which was an old book that I used to have, which um, literally took house by house and it gave a history of everything that had happened since the houses were built. So we know, for example, from this, that she was born the youngest of three siblings to a devout Christian family. And that's where her kind of a strong sense of morals and rules came because um, and, and everything that she did, she always said that she was doing doing the Lord's work. And when she was kind of lording it over everyone else and imposing her moral code upon anyone that she came into contact with, she just yeah was right. blaming it on blaming it on Jesus. It's all Jesus's fault. Mm. Um, in the early 1900s, um, we know that that's when she met M- Martha and Minnie, who were the other two witches that were to witches sit around the cauldron medicine. of the smoke with her. Yeah. Um, and in 1910, she started factory work. I started them young back in those days. Oh, yeah. In 1915, she got engaged to Phil Moss, who was killed in World War I. Um, and then she grows closer to a young Albert Tatlock, but rebuffs his offers of more than just friendship. Mm. In 1917, she met Alfred Sharples, who was recovering from a leg injury from the war. Um, and although they get they got on very well, it turned out he was already married, although in name only. What does that even mean? Loveless marriage. They were obviously having some kind of sexican standoff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's very soapy, I and mean, I've never read any of these old books apart from this Around the Houses one. But don't you think it'd be interesting to like have a like, couple of special yeah, coronation streets, it like would actually. set in the war? They didn't. I yeah, think they did they that with um, that. EastEnders once. They had like did a. They? I think like for for one episode they had like Doc Cotton when she was young. I can't remember who Would they she had. Fall over there. and have like a little vision of her childhood it'd be really really interesting it's I a mean, shame that Haley hasn't been in it for longer because she could go get drugged up and then she could drift off and we could have like a flashback about being harold <laughs> on the street <laughs> but yeah I'd, I'd love to see it i mean it'd be good for like I mean, Haley was talking about it being the beginning of uh, i mean the anniversary of world war one I. I mean it'd be perfect to have it would be it's a shame they didn't think of it already would have been it? good for the 50th anniversary maybe the 60th who knows um, anyway, 1918 was when um, Ina enjoyed her first drink in the Rovers, and uh, we all know that her first of many. Yeah, her favorite, famous tipple, tipple was a milk stout, whatever that is. It sounds absolutely disgusting. Is it made with milk? So, uh, milk stout. I don't so, know. I've got no. Are you gonna? Gemma's look hastily you. looking that one up on Wikipedia for us. Well, anyway, in 1920, well by 1920, um, Alfred's wife had died, so that freed him up for Ina. Um, and they had three children during the 1920s. Although, ah, here we go. Ian died after only a few days. Thought that was right. Um, so they were married in 1920, but by 1937, Alfred was dead himself which led, uh, left Ina to look after the two children who were growing pretty much fed up with her pious and judgmental attitude. So um, she was, yeah, they kind of drifted away from her because she, she was just trying to boss them around too much. Would you like to know about Milk Stout? Go on then, give us it a quick like What is a, Milk Stout? It's a very um, of its time drink. Yeah. A sort of thing that I can definitely imagine a woman like... Ina. Ina. <laughs> I was distracted. Drinking. It is a stout containing um, lact- lactose, a sugar derived from milk. Um, it adds sweetness, body and calories to the finished bit beer. Milk stout was claimed to be nutritious and was given to nursing mothers. Ah. Oh. The classic surviving example of milk stout is Mackerton's, for which the original brewers claimed each pint contains the energising carbohydrates of 10 ounces of pure dairy milk. That's in the gross. period just after the Second World War, when rationing was in place, the British government required brewers to remove the word milk from labels and adverts and any imagery associated with milk. Ah, oh, so that's the end of the milk. So what would happen if you went into a pub now and asked for a milk stout? They'd probably just shake it up with a bit of a... Uh, <laughs> gross. Uh, green top. <laughs> <laughs> now, at some point, and I, I don't know why I couldn't find a date for this, um, Ina took over the role of caretaker at the Glad Tidings Mission Hall on Victoria Street, um... And then she moved into the vestry with her daughter Vera, but she moved out in 1946. Now the vestry was like like a little flat there, and um, to to kind of so that you understand whereabouts it is. It's I think it was where they like the garage is now. The, the the back of the cabin was it was kind of over there. You so, know that it all floats in space, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. 
During World War Two, Ina acted as an air raid warden, which is a perfect job for her because it meant yeah, she gets to get to go around and yeah, be be in charge of everyone and kind of shine her torch through her, their curtains and everything. Probably so she could really lord it over them. Um, more than once. She um, contacted Arnold Tanner to let him know that Elsie was entertaining male callers while she was overseas. Uh, Ina had been against the Tanners right from when the newlyweds moved into the street because I think she recognised him as having thrown out like an old lady from from a house somewhere. It was like something to do with the property or anyway. Um, so she would like try and get in between them and cause trouble. And um, we know how promiscuous Elsie Tanner was, so she um, was not Back afraid at all to. Uh, yeah, she was not afraid at all <laughs> to um, tell on her. To, tell on her. <laughs> to her I'm husband. telling on you. Yeah. Um, in 1960, so we're into actual on Coronation Street now, she yeah. uh, collapsed with stress after the new mission lay preacher Leonard Swinley disapproved of her drinking in the Rovers. But it's milk stout, it's nutritious. Yeah. I think, yeah, she, she didn't like being told what to do. I don't think anyone could tell Ina what to do. And if she'd been drinking there for like 40 years she wasn't going to have any trumped up lay preacher telling her what she could and couldn't do um although 1961 she was sacked after spreading a rumor that coronation street was going to be demolished oh shocking mm. i wonder whether that was do that? i wonder whether that was anything to do with the fact that coronation street was originally supposed to only be like 12 or 13 episodes so they, I, I don't That'd know when about in the year it was. a way of ending it. Oh, we oh. can't make any more episodes because the street's been demolished. Yeah, not the first time that the threat of Coronation Street... Um, oh, no, not the last time, I mean, that the threat of Coronation <laughs> Street being demolished. You have to no, I think during the war it, it, was, quite, it was threatened somewhat oh, with yeah. being demolished. But um, nobody else would take the job. What She um, bribed the potential candidates to replace her not to take the job, so she ended up getting it back in the end. Also that year, we got to see the um, the famous showdown between her and Elsie Tanner because Elsie had received poison pen letters and thought it was Ina. But um, Ina was pretty much like, look, I w- if I had something to say to you, she, I wouldn't write it down and, and leave it an anonymous letter. I'd write Ina Sharples in big letters down the bottom of it. So they had this big fight in the street, um, and uh, that's often often one shown on clip shows. Um, in 1962, Ina suffered a minor stroke, and then in 1963, she was diagnosed with, oh, here's a good word, arteriosclerosis. Ar- arteriosclerosis, thank you. Um, and she broke down after the local youth, Michael Butterworth, stole her pension. And then she later broke into the vestry. No, he broke into the vestry Which later. Is what happened to Rita. <laughs> Michael Butterworth seems like such a wholesome name. I mean, Michael's okay. obviously a lovely name. And lovely Butterworth. Name. Yeah, it sounds, sounds delicious, actually. In 1965, the Weatherfield Mission Committee threatened to close Ina's mission, which I don't, don't know what that is. The, the, the mission, the, the place where she... The, the, it's kind of like a church. I was looking that up on Wikipedia as well, and it's like a, just a little religious kind of building. It's like a, a little church, but not actually a church. As to, we don't really have them these days. Well, <laughs> we have churches. Um, she, she was left at number eleven in the will of its previous owner, and she made Elsie and Dennis move out, which led to another famous showdown when she accidentally smashed one of the windows. Yeah. And she ended up selling number 11 to Edward Wormold after it transpired that the mission will stay open. Yeah. I mean, it obviously has closed. Edward, Edward Wormold was um, the kind of one of these unseen characters like Fat Brenda, and he um, used to own all of the houses, so everyone used to rent them back in those days. So they, like would the always, they would always moan about having to pay their rent to this Mr. Wormold, and, um, yeah, and he ended up getting he it anyway. He got bought out by the council at some point. Yeah, I think it kind of that it was just kind of swept under the carpet eventually. I don't know whether it was ever kind of officially <laughs> not his anymore. Um, so in 1966, um, Ina came back from her first ever holiday abroad to find that the mission had been converted into a community centre. No, what they let anyone in there, not yeah, just not religious, just religious people. people. That's not fair. So she resigned from her post well, and moved. To be fair, she didn't have one anymore, did she? <laughs> so um, she moved into number five with Minnie, which um, didn't work out particularly well. 
Um, she was fined 40 shillings that year as well for stealing two tins of salmon from the local supermarket. Is That's that, not very godly. Is that shillings, that sign, next to the 40 there? Like I know. A slash and a dash. I don't understand she that She was fined 40 slashes and dashes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, the community centre was closed by the end of the year, so she was able to move back into the vestry again. Where did she well. steal salmon for? I think um, that was all down. She had a little little breakdown. Oh. Like Roy's having a little breakdown and he's trying he to, steal to steal off strawberries. strawberries yeah. And then back in the old days, it was tins of salmon. Well, salmon is quite nice. 1967, tragedy struck the Sharples when her daughter Vera um, died of a brain tumour. Vera had moved away, remember, because she'd been fed up with you know, trying to control her life. Uh, but she came back and... Um, she didn't know that she had a brain tumour. Ina found out from the doctor that... Oh, no. I think she did know that she had a brain tumour, but she didn't know that she only had a few weeks to live. And oh. the, the doctor kind of, I think, inadvertently told Ina that, oh, yeah, your daughter's only got a few weeks left, but I haven't got the heart to tell her. So it's... Whoa. That would never happen these days. No, I know. Um, imagine that happening with Hayley. <laughs> Don't tell her. That would have been a way of getting... That a, strawberry's her last. That would have been a way of stopping the whole um, taking control and ending her own life. Yeah. She would have just dropped dead and she would have been taken by surprise. Exactly. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> um, also that year, Ina was injured when a tram crashed onto the street from the viaduct. Not as dramatic. Not quite as dramatic as... Um, uh, being trapped in a load of rubble and boiled sweets like Greta did. Well, she was the, one of the last people to be rescued from it, so that was kind of dramatic. Um, in 1968... Well, if Rita ate any sweets when she was down there, I would have I would have done the thing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. 1968, the council bought the land that the mission was on and turned it into a block of maisonettes. Bloody mission. Yeah. No, it's not the maisonettes that are there now. This was something that was um, kind of brought in by the programme makers to try and expand the programme a little bit. But because Granada's budget was so low, they <laughs> couldn't afford actors or... To, to, to populate the, to populate the houses. So for a lot of the time, those maisonettes were pretty much empty. Just and it was like kind of a bit of a running flats. joke. The Victoria Court flats, yeah, that pretty only much. only Nick and Leanne live in. And there's, there were some fairly big issues. Carla live there? Not remember. anymore. I don't remember. No, I don't know who lives in uh, there anymore. Apart What's from the point of them? Yeah, well, a few there are a few big scenes in the maisonettes, like when um, Ken's wife electrocuted herself with the hairdryer that, that happened in the maisonettes i think but in general they just they weren't particularly used and um they were they were quickly demolished a few years later so ina no longer had the vestry to live in however number six in the maisonettes was built pretty much where the vestry was so she just went and lived there instead whether they used the same set or not i don't know um but it was the first time for a long time that she had had to pay rent because one of the perks of being the mission caretaker was that she could live in the vestry rent free so she worked at the corner shop for a little bit um, this mission thing, that sounds like an old lady scam. <laughs> I don't, don't know. Think? I don't know what it is. Yeah, so she worked in the corner shop for a little bit anyway. Um, 1969, she moved into the flat above Ernest Bishop's camera shop. And in 1971, she got a caretaker's job in the community centre that was built on top of these maisonettes. So they so only it's last like. The like phoenix that rose out of the ashes of the mission. Yeah, now it's about to be in a community centre again. Um, although, because she was kind of getting pretty old by now, she was like, what, 72? Um, she couldn't really do the job very well. So Albert Tatlock was like her co caretaker, although I'm sure Ina made it very clear who was, she in, was charge. in charge. Yeah. Um, in 1973, Ina had two heart attacks. She's getting getting pretty old now, um, and she was sacked from the community centre after she'd wandered after off. After having the... a heart attack. No, they're, they're not that cruel. She wandered off with the keys one Christmas when the local children were going to be having a Christmas party there, and it meant they couldn't get in and get all their presents. What? Yeah. So sack her. Well, yeah, she was she was sacked or she resigned or something. Um, she went off to stay with an old friend living in St Anne's. I don't know where that is, but I assume it's somewhere nearby, which is where she stayed during most of 1974. Now. In real life, that's where I spent 1974. In St Anne's, in real life, um, the actress had had a stroke, so they had to kind of hastily write her out for a little bit. So in 1974, we only saw Ina for 13 episodes. Um, in 1975, she moved back onto the street when um, Alf Roberts gave Ina her job back at the community centre. Um, and by now, she was she was definitely getting on a bit, and the character had mellowed out a bit. So the the Ina of the early 1960s that were just 
have Battle an axe. argument with anyone. The the old curmudgeon battle axe. She was caught. She turned more into like everyone's nice favorite kind of grandma kind of character, I think. And um, in 1977, everyone rallied around her when um, Councillor Tattersall tried to get her to quit the job and live in a home. Um, we also saw her dress up as Queen Victoria that year for the Street Silver Jubilee celebrations. Oh, how quaint. Yes. Silver Jubilee. <laughs> in 1980, Ina had to move out of her flat for refurbishments. Um, she went to stay in St Anne's again with this friend, um, even though Elsie... Even had, though she didn't like her. Even though Elsie had offered to put her up, so you could tell just how much she'd mellowed out the fact that Elsie Tanner was offering to let you yeah. stay with her. Um, and she returned in April um, just to check how the refurbishments are going. They weren't ready, so she went back off again and never came back. And that was the last we saw of Ina. They they hadn't planned to write her out quite so um, abruptly as that, but Violet had just been getting worse and worse kind of health-wise. She'd been having big problems remembering her lines. Um, yeah, and she just she she never came that back. It. So it was a bit sad, really. That was the end of Elsie Tanner. No, it wasn't. That was the end of Ina Sharples. I can't even remember who we're talking about. <laughs> So I found that quite interesting to do the research on that because I really didn't know very much about Ina Sharples at all apart from the scenes that you see of her kind of hugging her milk stout in the Rovers, Minnie Coldwell. Making grimacing faces. Yeah, talking about how so-and-so was it, her mum broke wind and died. And, and obviously there was the, 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 high, the high noon kind of showdowns between her and, um, and Elsie. But I didn't really know very much about her and I certainly didn't know how she left the programme. So I was certainly educated this week when I was learning about Ina. Interesting stuff, I think, because she's she's such a curry icon and sometimes it's quite funny that I realise I don't know very much about what happened with them. Now, in 1985, there was a, a spin-off video called The Jubilee Years and that was when uh, Ken had commented that Ina had been dead a few years. Because in 1983, um, I think Christmas 1983, that's when v- um, Violet Carson um, sadly passed away herself. So I think they must have just tied Thank in the characters. She's death. not coming back. Not coming back now. I think we better get <laughs> we off. better draw a line under that bit one. Like they, bit like they did with Betty. Mm-hmm. Can't, they, they, they could only go so far with Betty kind of pulling a sickie. Yeah, <laughs> being in the back making hot pots. Yeah. She was most iconic for her costume yeah which involved hairnet and double-breasted coat which she, made her look quite wide yeah she was very wide. she was very imposing figure i mean she's different from like say blanche who's almost like a modern day ina sharples in a way because blanche is always so kind of skinny and skeletal like and kind of bird. a little frail old woman but can pack a punch but ina sharples i mean i wouldn't want to go up against her no i would not either she also yeah this hair net as well apparently this is quite funny she um the reason she had her hair net which i think appeared first appeared in episode five of coronation street was because she didn't want the makeup department um interfering with her hair because violet carson always had really uh, pristine silver locks underneath and she she didn't want anyone touching it so she put this hair net on like to stop people from messing with my hair obviously care a lot about how it looks i'm going to put a hair net on it when i'm on television (laughs) so no one can see it it's it's funny how these stories of like iconic props come in it's like like roy's um bag didn't that belong to his mum or something like that or he got the idea of his mum or something yeah um violet carson always said that um that that Violet Carson was destroyed the day Ina Sharples first appeared on Coronation Street. So it's like that once you t- once you take on a role of being in Coronation Street, you, that's it. That's what you you're going to be. Person. You're you're that person. And, and back in the, those days when they had two episodes a week, uh, and that they they probably didn't have very many breaks. They were in it all the time, and so you typecast. But I mean. Not a bad character to be typecast in, I suppose. It's a bit like Betty, isn't it? Like when we found out uh, after um, Betty Driver had died and we find out about all the, the singing and dancing that she'd done beforehand yeah, and, and acting and no everything. We had no it. idea about it any of that. It was not really mentioned that much, was it, by... No. She she was just Betty and she'd been Betty for so long and that's the same with Ina, really. Yeah. Um, I've got a quote here from somebody called Michael Mellia, who's a, an actor. He says that Ina was the most forbidding face on the street, a harridan in a hairnet with a surly expression that could stop a grown man in his tracks. Blimey. Mm. Um, now, Violet was awarded an OBE in 1965. Which uh, is that's, that's quite um, soon to be getting one, isn't it? Considering how the programme only started in 1960. Yes. 
I think I think I remember reading it was like the politicians at the time trying to show that they were trendy and with it, and oh, by God. by by trying to say, oh, let's let's get this person from this new upcoming Coronation Street and giving them an OBE, and that she used to, and I think she like went on tours to Australia and everything. She was she like was really a cultural ambassador. Yeah, she was really popular with the fans, I think. Um, but yeah. It's sad to say that um, Violet Carson died in December 1983 after failing to recover for an operation on an abscess. Mm. Sad way to go. Um, yeah, that I, I do kind of see like Blanche and Sylvia being modern day Ina Sharples, kind of both tell it like it is, not afraid to have a fight, um, lots of well, very cutting remarks against people, but... I don't think that either... Well, certainly not Sylvie. She's not been in it long enough. But I still don't think that Blanche will be remembered in the same way. I think most of it is to do with being in it at the beginning of the show. Yeah, when when you're in it at the beginning. They were way more theatrical with the characters back in those days because they were basing it on theatre to start with, weren't they? Yeah. Because the tradition of television was still rooted in theatre. Yeah, because ITV so... had only been around for a few years before even Coronation Street came, came in. So they weren't trying to go for realism or... No, not or really. Anything. So they they left a bit of a a, a mark, you know, like a, a, made a splash with their characters, and really were larger than life. They had a, a very much much smaller cast there as well, didn't they? And the scenes were much longer. I think there's like I, I was reading in the book that there's like at least twice as many scenes per episode now as there were back in the old days. And I guess that was you got to learn a bit more about the characters. And, yeah. And it, it was just a bit slower paced, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, more of a character study. Yeah. I, I wonder whether, like, if somebody like Ina was in it now, whether she would be... She'd get lost. Yeah. Just like the just like the other characters who are similar to her. Yeah. Oh, there's there's nobody particularly... We, we said before that there's not not enough old kind of old people in it. There's nobody really like Ina anymore. I think if um, Sylvia had stayed in it for... I think for... Gloria's the closest. Yeah, but she's, she's very different, isn't she? Gloria's just yeah, kind yeah. of a bit annoying now. I it, like her still. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to have um, like an older character that would boss the young ones around a little bit. The thing is, though, it, that comes from um, like being in it for such a long time. Whereas at the beginning of the show, they didn't need to build up that um, that history because they could. You imply, just assume it's all, yeah. yeah, imply that the history is already there. Any, anyone coming in now would have to sort of gain everyone's respect we should take a lot of doing yeah that's true actually and we i mean we're, are we gonna have to wait for one of the ones that's in it are we gonna have to wait for kylie to <laughs> yeah so to which, which characters at the moment could turn into these grumpy old women kylie i don't Leanne. think i can wait that long which which are the like the the Teen. aging ladies i mean i don't think gail was is going to be anything like that. I mean, Audrey, no way. Liz could be, I think, and just just from what yeah, we've been Liz seeing of Liz be, at the moment, yeah. she could turn into a bit of an Ina Sharples. Um, I was trying to think who else there is. I think was well, Sally's very good at lording it over people what as about well. About Eileen. Yeah, maybe. So there's a, there's a few potential candidates, I guess. I have to wait. Just have, have to, to wait. Mature a into it. A couple of decades and find yeah. out. Yeah. Tune in to episode 3084 <laughs> to find out. I think we'll have run out of character profiles by then, but you never know. Never know. So there we go, Ina Sharples, and a little tribute to the Lassa Gallery. We only went there once, but a nice little pub, and I don't even like pubs. No, I don't <laughs> go to pubs very much. Mm-hmm. 